Welcome to video three for week one. In the previous video, I defined the concept of definite integral, that it should measure the volume or hypervolume under a multivariable graph. And I also defined the limit formal approximation definition using the Riemann integral of what a definite integral should mean. Now I wanna talk about how to actually calculate those multivariable integrals, how to calculate those hypervolumes under the graphs of these scalar fields. So we return to the Riemann integral. It looked like this. I apologize, the notation's gonna get a little bit intense here, so do try and follow along with all of these indices and subscripts. I'll try and make it as clear as I can, but it does get a bit hairy. It happens with multivariable things. We've gotta keep track of multiple variables, multiple subdivisions, multiple sums. So I'm gonna take this general definition and specify just R2 to try and make the notation a little bit easier to handle. So I've got an interval in R2, so it's got some height and some width, and I'm dividing it up into k squared pieces. So this k to the n, n is two for R2. I'm gonna have k squared pieces. X is gonna go from A to B, Y is gonna go from C to D. One thing I can do is I can index this by counting across k in X and counting up k in Y. And I can do these two things differently. So to do this sum over all of these pieces, I can do it as two sums, one counting over, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to k, one in the x, one counting up, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to k, two in the y. And I'm gonna do these differently so that I can actually have different numbers of pieces. The, the two subdivisions could vary. So I could have, for example, four subdivisions um, in the x and six or seven subdivisions in the y, and I still get a subdivision of the interval into subintervals. I can still do the approximation. And then if I choose a point, x, l, star, in one of these, well, I can think of that as an x coordinate that's counting in the x, so it's gonna be one, two, three over in the x. I can think of it as a y coordinate, one, two, three, four, that's counting up in the y. And as I count over an x and up in y, I'm gonna count x, one, two, three, four, y is one, x, one, two, three, four, y is two, x, one, two, three, four, y is three. So as I do the two sums and have x i one star and y i one star, these are gonna, y i two star, these are gonna be the counts in x and y of the points in each of these intervals. So in this way, I split it up into something that I can count horizontally and something that I can count vertically. And now this limit here, I just had the limit as k goes to infinity because I had the same subdivision in each dimension. Here I have both these limits. Both of these bounds have to go in infinity. I have to divide it up um, more and more times horizontally. I have to divide it up more and more times vertically to get a finer and finer approximation process. This small piece of area that's gonna be the size of one of these subdivisions, well, that can be thought of as its height and its width. And this is gonna be, again, B minus A over, how many of these there are K1 here? And this one's gonna be C minus D over K2, exactly like it was for the single variable integral. If I multiply those two together, the height and the width, I'm gonna get the size of one of these small subdivisions. So I can think of this delta A instead of the delta Y times the delta X. The thing that this accomplishes is it lets me split up all of the y things and all of the x things. And this sum, oh, sorry, my apology is not that sum. This sum has nothing to do with this limit. This limit affects this k2, this k1 is independent. So I actually can take this sum out of that limit. And likewise, this x has nothing to do with this sum, so I can bracket off this sum and this limit in the y coordinate and have this dx outside. Sort of bracket up all the y pieces inside all of the x pieces, and that's what I get here. So now let me look at this thing that I've got in this bracket. So this is the limit as k2 goes to infinity, the sum from one to k2. As far as this limit is concerned, this thing is a constant. The only thing that's changing is the i coordinate, which has index i2 on it, or the y coordinate, which has index i2 on it. This thing is fixed. So this is in fact the limit definition of a Riemann integral in the variable y. So I can write this limit of this sum as a Riemann integral. y goes from c to d, so I put the bounds of the interval there. 
this X thing still sits there. It's still something in the I want the X place. The Y is now just a variable because I've now taken this approximation method. I now actually get an integral dy. So inside all this other X stuff, I can treat this Y stuff by momentarily pretending that the X is constant as a Y integral. And that momentarily pretending it's constant is justified because all the changes in X happen outside these brackets. Inside these brackets, X can really be fixed. All right, that gives me this. And then now, as far as these things are concerned, this, this is a sum in X, a limit in the bounds on X. This is a sum in pieces that vary in X. This is a width in X. And I have a function here, which depends on X I1 star. So this whole setup, this limit, this sum, this function, this width, is again a Riemann integral in one variable in X. So I can write that as the X bounds an integral, the function, where I replace x i1 star with just the x variable and a differential dx outside. So what I've done is I've turned this multivariable integral into what I call an iterated integral, where I can do one variable inside, and then once that variable is done, I can go on to do the other variable outside. And this is really quite remarkable. This is the thing we didn't have anything like in the extension of derivatives, when we did partial derivatives, we can actually just integrate sort of all of the variables in sequence and get a well-defined, complete, full notion of a definite integral. I could do this in as many dimensions as I want. I'm not going to write it in the full Rn, but here it is for three variables. So if I have an interval in R3, so the bounds in x, the bounds in y, and the bounds in z, then I can think of the definite integral over that interval as an iterated integral where I do the z, and then after the z is done, I do the y, and after the y is done, I do the x. I always work from the inside out in these iterated integrals. I always do the thing that's inside, and then I go to the next variable moving out, and then I go to the next variable moving out. And you might wonder why I put it in this order, y, z, y, and x. Well, you may recall we had Clairaut's theorem that told us we could interchange the order of partial derivatives. There's a lovely parallel theorem that we have in this course called Fubini's theorem that tells us I can actually change the order. I can do the order of the iterated integrals in any order I want. And that's true for any integrable function on a closed interval. So the order I chose of z, y, x in the previous slide, I could have chosen any of the six permutations of x, y, and z. And any of those orders would have given me the same result. That's the idea of an iterated integral. In the next video, I'll move on to some examples so you can sort of see how it works in practice. But this is going to be the thing that lets us do the calculations, because all we really have to do now is we have to do a bunch of single variable integrals. Now, integrals are not the easiest thing in the world, but we sort of understand those from calculus too. So we just need to do a bunch of those in a row, and that is in fact doing the multivariable integral.